So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session on uh, an introduction to GIMP. Some of you have attended our uh, Tuesday session uh, on draw.io. So how is GIMP uh, different from draw.io? The main difference is uh, what we saw on uh, Tuesday was uh, uh, a software that allows us to create vector illustrations. But today what we are going to see is a software that allows us to edit images at a very low level. What do we mean by low level? We mean uh, editing images at the at the level of pixels, which is not what we saw, uh, you know, on Tuesday because uh, vector editing software like Draw.io they enable us to edit images at a higher level of abstraction. Whereas today we are going to look at uh, how to edit at the pixel level. So that is what uh, GIMP is all about. Now, why did we select GIMP? There are uh, there are in fact lots of software out there. So, what is so special about GIMP? Firstly, GIMP has a lot of features. Uh, it's easy to use, in my opinion, uh, and uh, it's uh, open source, which means that you can, if you want, to look at the source code, make changes, improvements to the software. If you are not from a programming background, that's also fine. You can download the software for free and start using it. And uh, GIMP uh, is maintained by an active community of developers. Uh, and GIMP is not just uh, restricted to one purpose. You can use it for a variety of uh, disciplines, like marketing people can use it to make marketing collateral. Uh, technical people like us, we can use GIMP to make technical uh, illustrations. Or typically, we will take uh, uh, diagrams or figures or block diagrams which are available on the internet. And then we may make some modifications to those diagrams. When I say modifications, I mean improvements or corrections to those diagrams. So that is where uh, GIMP becomes useful. Another example would be uh, you take a diagram which is available on the internet, but you want to improve the diagram with some useful annotations for the reader. So when you want to uh, you know, make modifications like that uh, to an image, uh, again, GIMP becomes a very useful tool. Before getting to GIMP, uh, you might uh, have used other software which are similar in nature. The most famous software perhaps is Paint, which is available in Windows. And Paint is a very old software. It's been around maybe more than 30 years. And even today, there are some diehard, diehard fans of Paint. It's a very simple software. Uh, and even today, it's being actively used. Uh, so GIMP is in that same uh, uh, breadth, except that it provides a lot more features, meaning that there are a lot of things that you can't do in Paint, which are possible with GIMP. So that is what we are going to learn today. Again, because the nature of Devopedia is technical, uh, the uh, things that I'm going to share today or the examples that I'm going to show today will be more uh, of technical diagrams rather than general uh, pictures of animals or landscapes or photography, stuff like that. So the pictures that we are going to be editing will be more specific to uh, technical drawings. So it could be a flow diagram, block diagram, or uh, you know, architecture diagram and so forth. Okay, so with that introduction, I will share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Ramanathan, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch GIMP. So let's see how it launches. You can, of course, uh, later on, if you have already not done so, later on you can install it on your system. And it's available, I think, for almost all platforms, primarily uh, Linux. Mac and Windows. So I am on Windows and I'm using 2.10.8 version. So let's open. So this is the splash screen that I get for this particular version. If you install a more recent version, your screen may be slightly different. And this is the window that you see. This is a blank uh, drawing area. And on this, we can either open an existing image or we can create a new image. What you see on the left side, this is the toolbox, so to speak. You can actually expand it so you can see the description here. It is the toolbox. 
and uh, you can uh, kind of if you like a horizontal layout you can position it like this so that all the tools are available at the top the default one is the vertical layout so i stick to the default and this is how i use uh, gimp so let's uh, start by uh, looking at some basics of uh, gimp we'll not look at any particular diagrams technical or non technical we'll look at some basics basic tools commands and stuff like that get a feel of the software then we'll go and look at specific technical drawings and how to edit those technical drawings okay and in between i'll give some pauses for you to ask questions so let's start with uh, really basic stuff uh, to create a new diagram go to file and new now uh, like any good software there are a lot of shortcuts so to create a new diagram you can simply say control n and uh, to open an existing uh, image you can say control o and then navigate to that particular image to save you can say control s here it is minimized uh, here it is uh, uh, shaded out so this is control s is to save it then there are other things control p for printing and you know the typical commands uh, for editing control v for paste control c for copy control uh, x for cut so all those uh, commands are valid so let's start by creating a new diagram the first thing that you need to notice what is the width and the height you want to give to this image so you can select what kind of width and uh, height you want for that image uh, so here i'm using uh, you know what Uh, is a typical uh, high definition and de definition size but there are templates out here if you want a different size image you can select from the template so if i select this i get a image of these dimensions 640 by 480 or let's say i want something which is a4 size so this is the a4 size image in a probably this is a portrait mode because as you can see width is smaller than the height so this is a4 size image in portrait mode and so forth so you can create all this stuff uh, here so we'll start with the basic 640 by 480 what are some advanced options uh, we need not go into this but uh, just to show you you can select the color is it a rgb image or a grayscale image what is the kind of precision you want and uh, the probably the useful uh, option is this one how do you want the image to be filled with when you start so we are saying let the image be filled with the background color that is what we are saying here okay so let's see uh, uh, what we get when we click this okay so now we got an image of dimensions as you can see here on the top in the title bar 640 by 480 so this is the image and it has been filled with the background color just the way we wanted it now how do you know which is the background color so for that you have on the left side of uh, tool you can see here two small rectangles on the left side so the rectangle on top shows the foreground color then the rectangle below that shows the background color so if i click for example the rectangle at the bottom it tells me change the background color so i can change the background color to red for example right i can change the foreground color let's say to light blue so now you can see i have changed the foreground color and the background color but you notice that the image has not changed because this color that you see here is the color of the background when we created the image at that time the background was white so just because you changed it in the tool doesn't mean your image is going to change so let's assume that you want to now fill the background with the background color which is red so what do you do simple select all so now it selects the entire image so you can see here a slight uh, uh, selection of the border which is kind of uh, animated so it is slowly moving so that indicates that something has been selected and after selecting you can simply say go to edit fill with background color as you can see here so now you got your background in blue very simple stuff nothing complex going on here so uh, let's go to uh, something else what do we want to do next maybe in this on this background we want to add some text so here now we start using some of the tools from the toolbox so one of the tools is this one which is marked with the letter a capital a 
So this is the text tool. So if I click on this, I get the cursor for writing text. So I click this and I say. Hello Bangalore. So notice some defaults are automatically applied. The font is this particular font. The size of the text is 18 and the color is the foreground color. So foreground color as you know is blue. So that is the color that has been selected. So now what do we do? We want to change the way this text is represented. So we select it by double clicking. We select the entire text. We increase the font to 40. This color is not good on a red background, so let's make it white. So I can select here white. So it, this is not exactly white. This is white, all F. So you can also select from here using your mouse. You can select right at the left corner, then it's white. So now you see my uh, text has become white on a red ba uh, background. Now for this particular, you can also change the font. Let's say I want a different font, Arial as the font. Arial is the font I want. So I can select it to Arial. Now there is something interesting, uh, more interesting that you can do. Suppose I want to change the spacing between the letters. Maybe I feel Arial is a good font, but uh, let's say I feel that for my design, this is a little bit too cramped. I want to increase the spacing between the letters. So what do I do? I have options here. So this is change baseline of selected text, change kerning, kerning of te sele selected text. So probably this is the one. So now you see by increasing the kerning, I am able to control the amount of space between the letters, between the characters in my text. So now this is a bit more readable text. Okay. So, so far so good. We are being co covering only the basics. Now let's assume I have this text on a red background. I want a slightly different background for the text. Maybe I want a black background for the text. So what I really want is I want to put a rectangle. Here and then make that rectangle. Black, so let's see how how we do this. So I take this. So uh, what did I do first? Let me go back there. So previously we used the text tool. Now we are using something called a rectangle tool, which is the. Top uh, left icon here in the toolbox. So if you hover your mouse, it will tell you rectangle select tool. So I click this, then my cursor changes and I create a rectangle like this. Mind you, I have not actually created a rectangle. What I have really done at this point is select an area of the image with my rectangle tool. After selecting it, what can I do with this? I can say. Say for example, what can I do with this? I can say fill this. Fill with foreground color, fill with background color and other options. So one of the easiest things to do probably is let's say. I go here, I select black as my foreground color and I say. Fill with foreground color. Now this is not kind of the thing that we wanted because what has happened? What has happened is it has uh, gone and replaced. The image. So. What has happened? Uh, what has happened is uh, actually it has selected the text. This is not what we wanted. So uh, before uh, going to the next level of discussion, I want to now introduce a concept called layers, which is uh, one of the most useful and important uh, features in GIMP. So the way to uh, look at layers is to do control L. If you do control L, you will get a new tool window which indicates what are the layers that you have in your image. Now you see earlier we selected a rectangle like this. But when we filled the rectangle with this color, the whole rectangle did not get colored. Only this part which has the text got colored. So what was the problem in this case? So to understand this problem, we need to understand the concept of layers. So now you can see here, I will undo my changes first. You can see here on this window, there are two layers in my image. There is a background layer and on top of that, there is one more layer where we type the text. What does this mean? It means that 
anything that you do, like for example, in this case, we typed a text. The text was automatically added in a separate layer. It was not added directly on the background. What is the implication of this? The implication is the pixels on the background layer have not been touched by this text. The pixels on the background layer, they stay red. OK, so whatever we have typed in white uh, pixels for the text that is placed in a separate in, uh, layer. Now you may ask what is the advantage of doing uh, this in layers? The advantage is now your layer is independent of the background, which means that now you can drag and drop the layers in other parts of the image. Suppose I don't want the hello Bangalore to be here. I want to move it to somewhere here. I can do that. But if you were to do this on the same layer as the background, it will not be possible to move you move the particular text to different parts of the image. Because remember, this is editing at the level of pixels. So when you edit at the level of pixels, if you were to do the edit on the background layer, you would be modifying the colors of the background layer to render this text. By placing the text on a separate layer, you keep this text independent of the background which means that now you get a lot of power and flexibility. Now you can drag and drop this text to any other part of the image without affecting the background. OK, so now we come back to our original problem, which is I want to put this text in a different background. So I'll go back to my rectangle tool and I will select it. And I will say fill with the foreground color, which is like dark blue. Now you see what has happened. This is not what we wanted. What has happened is it has filled the text layer with the color. That is because in the layers tool, we have selected the text layer. So this is clearly not we want. So we undo this control Z. Instead, we select the background layer. OK, we select the background layer and on the background background layer, we say fill with foreground color. Now you see what has happened. So this is kind of probably what we wanted. You can say this is probably what we wanted, but maybe this is not what we wanted, but at least we have covered one important feature of the tool, which is how to work with layers. So one problem in this approach is that now you cannot move the text. You can move the text, but if you move the text, for example, let me select the text. To move the text, you have to select this particular tool, move tool which can also be selected by simply typing M on your keyboard. So I am I have selected this layer. I have selected the move tool and I drag and drop. So now I can move the text, but you notice that this rectangle stays here. The rectangle cannot be moved. And the reason is we have modified the background. This rectangle has been created on the background. So rectangle cannot be moved. So if you want the rectangle also to move, then the solution is simple. You uh, create a new layer. So now we are going to create a new layer. And it is asking you what kind of uh, colors you want to create and so forth. So let's go with uh, uh, transparency. Right? So we have created a new layer here and notice that the layer is uh, on top of Hello Bangalore. So we want the layer to be below Hello Bangalore, so we can reorder the layer, move the layer below. And on this layer, so select the layer. Back to your rectangle tool. Select it. Now you color the layer as before. Fill with foreground color. Now you see you have three layers in your image. You have a background, then you have another layer which has this blue rectangle. And then on top of that, you have Hello Bangalore. Now the power that you have is you can move both both of these. So I can say select the move tool. I can move the rectangle. I can select Hello Bangalore. I can move Hello Bangalore as well. So I can move both of them while the background stays the same. OK, so any questions at this point? How to increase the size of the font? Yeah, so to increase the size of the font, select the this one text tool, which is T. OK, 
then select your text layer right now our text layer is hello bangalore so select that and after selecting it you get the options here arial 40 so if i want it to be 50 i say 50 is that clear yes yeah and you can also change the color of the text as i showed you earlier so if i want yellow i make it yellow any other questions So now I'll quickly cover many of the other features. Uh, these are the basics, so I spent a little bit of time explaining these things. But now I'll qu quickly cover many of the other features uh, which you can play around with later. So, so far we have been dealing with uh, what we have been dealing with mostly uh, rectangles, texts and so forth. What if you want to uh, select a circle? So the next tool here is the ellipse tool. So you can select this. You can do a, a circle selection or if you do like this, it will be elliptical selection. And once you have selected that, you can play around with this. So suppose I want to fill it with foreground color, I can fill it. If I don't want foreground color, I can also fill it with a pattern. So if you see in this menu, edit menu, fill it with a pattern. And you can select what kind of pattern you want. So how do I make that selection? I can double click here. So probably here you get uh, a bunch of patterns. Fill it, fill selection outline. So fill it with pattern. Uh, so here we have gradient tool. So one of these tools will be a pattern tool. The gradient tool. Let's look at the gradient tool. So gradient, as the name suggests, it creates a gradient. So let's say uh, shape linear. OK, so let's say linear shape. OK, and then what we do now, you see this ellipse is still selected. You can see the slight border which is hovering. If you want a bigger view, you can always zoom in. So because when you are editing fine details, you may want to zoom in. You don't want to look at the image at 100% zoom. So you can always zoom in. If you want twice the zoom, 200%, simply type 2. OK, so I, I will zoom in 2. So you can see the border slightly moving. It's, it shows that this particular area has been selected. So I drag and drop here. Notice how the background is changing. What I'm doing, I'm filling this elliptical shape with a gradient of color. So how is the grade colors of the gradient determined? On the left side, we start with the foreground color. In our case, the foreground is dark blue. And on the right, it moves towards the background color, which is red. So this is how you create gra gradient. And there are many options to play with here. So what we selected is a, a kind of a linear shape. You can also do bilinear. So then you, after selecting bilinear, you come back here. You can undo this. So bilinear, uh, it's a kind of hard to make out the difference, but uh, mathematically there is a difference the way it shifts. You can do radial, so that is also useful. So you can do radial. So radial gradient is as if you uh, you know a, a drop on a pond and waves going out of it. So that is the kind of effect you get. So the gradient starts from this point and then moves out. So you can see here, here it is a kind of a foreground color blue. And then as you move away from that center point, it, it becomes closer to the background color, which is red. So this is the gradient tool and uh, there are so many other options uh, here, which you can experiment with later. So another one here uh, and so forth. OK, so these are the gradients that uh, you need to deal with. Now, uh, let's say uh, something like this. Uh, alignment tool. Alignment tool is also very useful. So let's go back to the layers. Control L. And let's put our image uh, zoom out. So I have our layers here. Hello, Bangalore here. 
and so forth. So there is another feature called alignment. I have not used this uh, too much, but uh, it can be a useful feature. So let's say I take this particular layer here and. Uh, now uh, notice the size of the layer. Uh, that is another point I want to show you. See all the layers have sizes. Image has a size. We know the size of the image 640 by 480. Layers have sizes. So if I select this particular layer and I say what is the size of the layer? Layer boundary size, scale layer. So you see that the layer also has similar size as the image. But the positioning of this size is very different because as you can see here, uh, it is like some of the part of the layer is going out of the image. That is because we moved the image after creating it, moved the layer after creating it. So there is a way to trim this layer only to the content. So how to do that? Go to layer. You can say crop to selection or crop to content. So if I do, do crop to content, now you see the layer is only this much. So this makes your kind of, uh, kind of your design uh, much cleaner. So now you know that your layer dimensions are only this much and you can play with this uh, particular selection more easily. So what I wanted to show you was uh, uh, alignment of layers. Uh, so let's say. Relative to image. Distribute. So like I said, I have not used this tool too much uh, because uh, it's there are uh, it, it, there are many conditions to make it work. So in this particular case, uh, what I wanted to do was maybe align this image to the side. So that is the purpose of this tool, uh, aligning this particular layer to, to the left hand uh, you know, edge of the image. So that is the purpose of the tool relative to image. I want to align it left edge of the target. So something like this I wanted to achieve, but uh, it is not uh, working the way I expected. So uh, oh, okay, maybe because of the selection. So let us uh, unselect that and then go back to our layer and maybe select the whole layer. Sorry, go back to our layer here. Select the layer. And see if it works. So yeah, like I said, I have not used this too much. Uh, so maybe if you Google it, try to find out more how to do the alignment, uh, then you can find out. But the purpose of the alignment tool is, uh, you know, to align layers if you require some sort of an alignment. But otherwise uh, there is uh, probably yeah so uh, i have not like uh, used this alignment tool too much the main tools that i use are these uh, rectangle ellipse and uh, moving the uh, text tool moving of the tool zoom i have already shown you how to do the zooming there are few other tools which we will cover when we look at uh, some more examples any questions at this point uh, so saving the image uh, let's uh, do that so the way to save the image control S uh, when you save the image, the image will be saved in a format called XCF. So don't save the image as JPEG or uh, GIF or PNG or any of those formats. So the proper way to save a GIMP image is this XCF format. Why is this important? Because this format preserves all the layers, which means that the next time you load the image, you should be able to edit all the uh, layers together. So that's what we will do. We will uh, say example one dot XCF. And it's done. Now the problem is you can't use this image on a web browser or embed into Word documents because it's a particular format for uh, GIMP. So there is a functionality to export the image in a way it can be shared with uh, other software. So that is uh, not saving. It is more like exporting. So when you export, you do it this way. 
So there you can select either you want a PNG image or a JPEG image and so forth. So let's save as PNG first. So I export it as PNG. And uh, OK, the options are looking OK, so let's save it. So it is done. Next, I can also export it as JPEG. So we'll do that. Export the same image as JPEG. When you are exporting as JPEG, you can select the desired quality of the final image. So typically, you know, 80% is a good uh, compromise between quality and the size of the image. Whereas if you put like 97%, you will get uh, like a marginally improved quality, but the size of the image becomes too big. So the ideal size, in my opinion, is 80%, 80% quality. And if you export it, uh, it's done. So now let's go and look at that images that we have exported. So you can see the original image uh, XCF format 138 KB. The, this is the PNG file, which is 57 KB. Then this is our JPEG image, which is uh, only 20 KB. Let's open this. So this is the PNG image, which is like uh, 57 KB. And this is the JPEG image, which is 20 KB. You see there is no visible difference in quality. So JPEG typically will give you much smaller file size compared to PNG. OK, now these two images can be shared on the web or you can embed into other documents such as Word documents. But when you want to edit the image, you should fall back on the XCF uh, format, which is used by GIMP for editing the image. Any questions? So it is not an SVG then? It is not an SVG, yeah. So SVG is for vector graphics. So I will explain what is the difference. See, look at this particular layer, which is colored in, uh, which has a rectangle colored in blue, dark blue. So now uh, GIMP is, as you know, it's a, a image editing software. It is not a vector uh, graphics. So by coloring this, what GIMP has done, it has modified all the pixels to blue color uh, in this layer. So GIMP has not much idea, or even if you look at this particular uh, background here, GIMP doesn't really know that there is an ellipse here and there is some sort of a gradient, radial gradient here. So everything is done at the level of pixels, whereas in vector graphics, when you create a rectangle or a create an ellipse, the software knows exactly what is the diamond, uh, what what is the what are the coordinates of each of the edges of the rectangle, what are the coordinates of the let's say the focal point of the ellipse. The vector graphics tool knows that, whereas here it is very dumb in that sense. It doesn't know all that. It only looks at pixels. Okay, so. Uh, we don't get the benefits of SVG when we work with uh, GIMP. Yeah, that, but right? that is where that is where the power of layers comes through. Even though you don't have the power of uh, vector illustrations, we have neatly separated the text from this blue rectangle from the background. Okay. So we are kind of mimicking the behavior of vector graphics using layers. Only thing is you can't export uh, like in vector graphics but you have the editing power because you are now working with layers. Okay. Whereas in vector graphics, you don't really need the concept of layers, although some sophisticated software have layers in uh, for vector graphics as well, because uh, the software recognizes each shape individually. So okay. the shape can be selected and moved around even without the concept of layers. But we mimic that behavior in GIMP using layers. OK, so whatever JPG image we created out of this XCF, uh, when I when we enlarge will the pixels. Uh, yeah, there will be some the degradation, pixels? yes, because this okay. is only for sharing, not for editing. OK, distort the picture, right? When you, so if you start, it, uh, you know, approaching it closer and closer, you will start seeing OK. The, it is not smooth like in vector graphics. If you blow it up beyond a certain level. Okay. 
got it so that means when you are creating or editing images in gimp you are automatically starting from a certain baseline quality you can you can marginally improve the quality of the original image let's say by sharpening the text and something like that mm-hmm. but you cannot dramatically improve the quality okay thanks any other questions uh, so the basics are covered now we will go to some specific examples before going to the examples if there are any questions i will answer them uh, how do you find out which layer the hello background is the hello bangalore is on yeah so uh, that's also a good question so you can see here uh, automatically gimp gives a name to each image you see here on the left three layers so automatically uh, gimp has given a, a name to this uh, layer and it has given it hello bangalore so this itself is an indication if you want you can change this name also this is only name of the layer so i can say text layer or greeting greetings so i call it greetings so i will say you know uh, text background so this is overall background and so on now another trick is suppose when you are editing you don't want some layers to be visible you can disable it the layer is still there only thing is by clicking on this i icon you have disabled the view of the layer in the image so there is another trick here this is also very useful uh, maybe you have created the image with a lot of layers but when you are exporting you don't want this particular rectangle to be visible so then you just uh, hide that particular layer and then you export so once you are done that you can go and see here you notice the jpeg image now it is not having the rectangle because what did you do you did not modify the delete the layer instead you simply disabled the layer made it invisible and then you exported the image so that way you can have many variations of the image from the same source file so when you want you can uh, enable it and then export accordingly okay yeah there are many other features i will show you later in the examples uh, so any other questions okay now as you know this uh, session is mainly meant for devopedia authors we are focusing on technical drawings so let's look at some of the examples of technical drawings in devopedia so this is an article c++ inheritance where there is a technical drawing here so the drawing is quite complex there are lot of boxes blue boxes and then some of the boxes have a different uh, are standing on a different background color okay and this particular image is picked up from a certain source called chauhan 2021 so let's go to this particular source and see how the original image was so can people see this this is the original image can you see it yes so notice that the original image has a plain white background now the problem with this is the image is quite complex there are way too many boxes and the boxes are grouped together and by making the whole background white uh, it becomes very confusing to figure out what the image is actually doing so the way we have enhanced the image in devopedia before putting it out for each logical group we are given a different background color now this makes the image much more readable because now by color we are Uh, telling the reader this is one particular group and so forth so how do we do this in gimp okay so let's take a look so i have probably so the, the thing is if you are working on recent files gimp keeps track of all the recent files that you have opened so that can also be useful for quickly opening up file and it also gives is uh, recently used files and folders and so forth so that can be a useful uh, thing uh, so i know that uh, where is the file it is in a particular folder so i have to navigate to that folder documents 
Doc, Devopedia, Articles, Drawings. So here, uh, what is the image we are looking at? Uh, C++ something. So you can see here all the XCF files are there. I mean, the. so by the way, GIMP can also open uh, SVG files, but the editing that you do will not be uh, in vector way. So yeah, editing on, uh, it will be imported, but the editing will be at the level of pixels. So you have to keep that in mind. So let's look at uh, this particular image, uh, which is uh, this one, okay. So this is the image which we have already edited. To make sense of the image, let's open up the layers. So what is the shortcut for opening up the layers? Control L. So if I do Control L, I get this pop-up. And you notice that there are only two layers. This is the original layer, which is the file that we imported from the website. And we have created one more layer for that, which is this one. Which is containing the so called uh, colors. Okay, so how we have managed to achieve this? It is very simple. We created a new layer, and on that layer, we added the colors. So let's try to do this again. I have disabled that layer. What we'll do, we'll create a new layer, and the layer is transparency. Okay, uh, you can also make it white if you want. So let's say white. Now this layer is on top, so we can move it to the bottom. So the layer goes to the bottom. Now on this layer, we want to make colors. So obviously we are only selecting rectangles here. So let's do a control, R, uh, not control R, simply R. So you get a rectangle tool. Before drawing the rectangle, we select, make sure we select the background layer. So we call it background color layer. Right? So the layers we have is background color layer, and this is where the boxes are on top. This layer is not no longer required. We have uh, kind of disabled it. So background layer. So what we do, we select this background layer and we draw a small box here. Position it properly. If you don't get the position properly, you can adjust. So I can adjust it like this. And having done that, now I will fill it with a color. So now my color is active foreground color. It, it's a very dark color. We don't want such a dark color. Maybe we'll lighten it to something like this. And then say, fill with foreground color. Right Now it is actually filled. You can see, you don't see it because what is happening? Can somebody explain? Already we have filled it. See, this is what we have here, but in the final image, we are not able to see it. So C++ types is uh, not transparent. That is one way to put it, but basically what is happening is both these uh, layers are taking up the whole image. Right, they are taking up the whole image. And uh, this layer, which is the C++ types, that is on top. So if you move this to the bottom, this comes on top. Are you following? Yes. Right, now this comes on top. But what we want, we want both the layers to be visible. How is that possible? So for that, we have to change a few settings. So what we can do is, we go back to this layer, we can reduce the opacity of the layer. Now you see what happens. So originally the opacity of the layer is 100%, which means that the new layer, color layer that we have added is visible. But the background of boxes is no longer visible. So to make the background boxes, you reduce the opacity. I make the opacity 50%. Now you see something interesting happens. I can see the background plus the foreground. But what I mean is both the layers are visible. The reason is we have given a transparent uh, opacity of 50% to the this layer, color layer. Let's call it color layer. So to color layer, I have given 50% opacity. Now this is a problem. The problem with this approach is that uh, even though I have done it like this, 
now my image becomes lighter so that again reduces this the readability of the text on the image so we don't want that we don't want to reduce the readability rather we want to preserve the same contrast in the image only thing is we want to color the border differently so this opacity is not the correct approach it may be the right approach for many other diagrams but not in this case so basically what we have we have two layers somehow we want to show both the layers effectively so this is where one of the powerful features comes in which is how do you combine two layers the default way is normal combining but there are many other ways so i will simply use my uh, keyboard down arrow to move to other particular ways of combining dissolve nothing happens color erase now you see something interest, interesting has happened so what has happened it has uh, done some transformation where both the layers are visible but this is probably not we what we want so we keep moving down erase merge split lighten only screen dodge addition aha so now we found something which seems to make sense so we've got the original image as it is plus we have been able to put a color to the background so this is exactly what has been done in the final image here as you can see here i will delete the new layer this is how we did it we selected all these different rectangles colored each one one by one and after coloring we merged the two layers using this option darken only by doing that we were able to effectively combine the original image and a palette of background colors only two layers layers are required in this particular example but if you want you can you could have done it uh, in different layers for example each of this rectangles could be a separate layer on its own but for this trivial image that is not necessary any questions on this i hope this example is clear so what did we cover here how to combine two layers that is the important thing that we covered here if no questions we will move on to the next example next example is an article on github okay so we are going to look at this particular example how does this example appear in the source it appears like this so there are a couple of things which are wrong in this image first thing is uh, the clone here there is uh, like one part of the image is about what is happening in github the other part of the image shows what is happening in a local machine unfortunately the clone is left out in between the two so the uh, so uh, clone is uh, very particular to the local machine when you clone you are actually uh, cloning to the local machine that is the purpose of the command so the way i wanted to en enhance this diagram was to expand this blue color to this edge that is the first thing uh, we need to do the second thing is this th uh, text here upstream this is actually a incorrect representation of what is actually happening here so that we have to correct instead of saying upstream we say fetch or pull that is exactly what is happening when we move code from the uh, organization repository to the master branch so uh, to say it is upstream is wrong so this is a tip for devopedia authors uh, when you use images from the web always look for spelling errors look for uh, other kind of semantic errors like this and use a tool like gimp to correct for these errors so what we are going to do to see how we can correct this particular image for our purpose so we'll save this okay already we have it saved here so let's call it github it's a png image we don't need this delete it recently downloaded it so where is that documents downloads 
and uh, GitHub PNG. So let's open this. Now, if I zoom in, what is the command for zooming in? Anybody remembers from the keyboard? If I want to zoom to 200%, you can Control use number two. two. Yeah, I can simply type the number two. Okay. So this zooms in 200%. Now you notice there is a unnecessary empty space at the edge of the image. Can people see it on the left edge? Yes. Right. If I zoom out, you can see maybe more clearly. You can see here there is a space here at the left edge of the image. Which is not there in the other places of the image. So if I have to zoom out. You can see here at the top edge also there is an unnecessary space. So how do we get rid of this? Any suggestions how to get rid of this extra space? So one easy way is like this. So let's uh, maybe zoom out a little bit. I know that we have the rectangle tool right at my disposal. So select the rectangle tool and you select the part. How you want to crop it. So position it somewhere here. And drag it. If I want I can adjust a little bit also. And after doing this I say image crop to selection. So why I have chosen this image yeah, this particular option because first I have selected a part of the image and then I go here image crop to selection. So now that extra space is removed. But there is an easier way. The easier way is you don't even need to select. Go to image. You can select this option which is a very easy way to crop crop to content. When you say crop to content automatically it determines which are the unnecessary spaces at the edge of the image and removes them automatically. So now you have a clean uh, starting point for your editing. Now the first thing to do is. Replace this with a blue color. Got it. See what what is the effect that we want finally? What is the kind of effect we want? We want that empty area to be colored in blue, light blue, the way it is colored here. Now uh, the first technique is the first thing to do is find out what is this color. Get this color into our palette. So that is easily done by this tool called color picker. So you can see here I am hovering here. It is called color picker. The shortcut for that is O. So I click this tool. I got the color picker and I click on this area. Now you see that my foreground color has changed. Right? So earlier it was some darker shade of blue. Now the foreground has changed because I've used the color picker tool and clicked on this area. And if I double click on this, I can see the exact foreground color. This is the HTML code of the color. It is not white. It is this light shade of blue. So now we've got that. How do I deal with this empty area here? Any suggestions? Can I use my rectangle tool? So yes, I can use my rectangle tool. I will select this area and then I will color it. Fill with foreground color, but this is not what we want because it is overwriting the arrow. We want to preserve the arrow. So is there any better way? Yes, there is a better way. You can add a layer. New layer. Let's add a new layer. OK, obviously now the layer is covering the whole image, so we want to make the layer go to the background. Aha, now we got something already working. So what did we do? We simply created a new layer. And after creating the new layer, we moved the layer to the bottom of the layer stack. And now the layer because the layer was created with white color, it is showing white. So now the solution is very simple. Because this area of the image was transparent, we are able to see the bottom layer automatically. So now the solution is very simple. All we need to do is change the color of the layer to this color. So you select the layer and say edit. 
fill with foreground color. Let's select the entire layer. So select the layer, select all, fill with foreground color. So done. This is exactly what we wanted. Is everyone following? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Now I will show you another trick how the same thing can be done without layers. Because the, it is important to know many different techniques because the layer technique may not always work. So I am de deleting that layer. I select the layer, I delete it. I get back my original thing. There is another technique which we can do, which is called magic select tool. Uh, so it is also called uh, fuzzy select tool. So that is the fourth icon here in the toolbox. It can also be selected with the uh, shortcut U. So if I select this, what this does is it will select all contiguous pixels which have the similar uh, characteristics like color, for example. In this case, it is transparency. So let's uh, zoom in and see what happens if I click on this area. Notice the selection. Can you see it? What it has selected is it has selected this particular area. Right. Now you can select this also by doing shift click. So first I selected this. Next I go here. I do a shift click. So now I've selected this area plus this area and but I have left out this arrow in between. So this is again a very powerful feature. I do this again here. Shift click. I have done this now. One thing is missing. If I zoom in, you will notice what is missing in our selection. In our selection, what is missing? We have selected all these areas of transparency, but there is an area inside the O, inside the E, which we have not selected. So you can select that as well. Control, uh, not control, shift click. So the internal areas are also selected. Shift click. So now we have selected all the areas of transparency. What is outside as well as what is inside. Now having done that, we can simply say fill with foreground color. So now we have achieved the same effect as before. Previously we did it with layers. Now we did it on the same layer. Are you following? Yes. Yes. OK. Now the last bit of thing that we need to do is get rid of this and replace it with a different text. Pitch pull. Now uh, you can't do it with uh, you can do it with rectangle, but it is very troublesome. Right, I can select this and then I say delete from the keyboard. I can select this, say delete. It is very troublesome to do this rectangle by small rectangles, but there is an easier tool. This is called freehand select tool, free select tool. So click this. I have selected a free select tool. Select none. Now I select by doing a freehand drawing. So make sure it is selected properly. So it's a bit difficult to get it right uh, first time. So you can, uh, if you make mistakes, you can clear it, undo it and stuff like that. So this is not the selection we want. Select none. So again, we tried. So it can be freehand or you can do it with points like this. This may be a better option. Okay, it is selected. And uh, you delete it and then you fill it with the foreground color. So we have got rid of the uh, text. So now we can add our own text. So what is that we wanted to add? Fetch pull. We can't see the text because our text is also in foreground color. So you change the color to black. Okay. 
and then you make it a bigger font. Something which is very similar to what you have in the original diagram. And then it looks like the font is Arial. So we select something close to that. We don't know what is the actual font used in the original image. So we try our best uh, to choose something which is very close to what you see here. So that way we have selected it and uh, we are done with this. Now notice this will be in a separate layer by itself. This text is in a separate layer. As you can see here. So now we move the text. How do you move? So you have the move toolbar here, tool here, or you can simply type M. And having done that, you move it. And once you move it uh, to this area, you can uh, rotate it. So there is a rotate uh, tool here, which is this one rotate tool. So click on that and then you start rotating. You can also specify here what is the angle of rotation. And then you say rotate and it is done. Uh, so the thing is rotated uh, transformation will be in a separate layer. So you can say to new layer. And then this probably we can disable. So th that is how it can be done. Let's go back here. So another uh, thing to do is probably this one. Uh, see the size of the text layer is very minimal. So that is causing some issue probably. So we'll say layer to image size. So we expand the size of the text layer and then we can rotate it. Okay, it is truncating it for some reason. Okay, rotate. Yeah. Uh, okay, and some this selection. So always be aware of what is selected. Some old selection is there, so that that is uh, causing an issue. So now we rotate it. So you can see here the whole uh, image is rotated, but it is not truncated. So that is uh, what we want. And after rotating, we can move it. So this is kind of what we wanted. Okay. Any questions? So what did we cover in this example? We covered how to uh, replace a particular transparent area uh, with a background color using layers. We also saw the color select tool to get a color from the existing image. We also saw how to add text and rotate the text. So these are the extra things that we covered in this particular example. Next example, uh, probably we have two more examples. OK, so in this particular example, we have taken a screenshot and then on that screenshot, we have done uh, annotations in red. So we look at this particular example, which is. Uh, probably this image already that image is there. So I'll show you what how was the original image. We can do that by simply disabling the layers. Hiding the layers rather. Else we have. OK, so this was the original screenshot. Simply a screenshot taken from uh, one particular software called VS Code. But this screenshot alone is not useful for the reader. The person who is reading our article on Devopedia. The screenshot says only a few things. So we want to give annotations to the screenshot to make it easier for the reader to understand what is happening in which parts of the screen. So to place these annotations, we have created layers and all these layers have nothing but text. Okay. So let's start with a very simple text here, which is there on an independent layer by itself. So we have created a layer here. And uh, it has two things, log4j, so it has some bit of text and then there's an arrow symbol. 
So arrow symbol was obtained uh, probably uh, you you can uh, copy it easily. Like if you go to Google, right arrow symbol. So you will get straight away right arrow here. So you just copy it and paste it into a, your tool. So suppose I create a new text layer. I can simply paste that arrow here. So I will change the font. So you see I got my black arrow here. And if I want to increase the font, same procedures like earlier. I can increase the font. Font size rather. So this is the way to get an arrow into the system. So this as an example I said, so I will delete the layer. So this is how one annotation was created and uh, there's nothing uh, special here. All the other annotations that you see in this particular image are created in the same way. So if I scroll to this side, I have other annotations, but they are all disabled. So we'll start enabling them one by one. So zoom out one level. So uh, what, what did we do? Enable this. So the main thing I want to show you is uh, notice something that is happening here. Here you have actually two layers. I will show, show it to you here over here. You have a layer here, which is arrow, the diagonal arrow. So I am disabling the diagonal arrow. Then there is another layer, which is the text with the horizontal arrow. So there are actually two layers here. But the thing is, these two layers go together. Right? So uh, if I let's say want to move. I would probably move both of uh, both of these layers together. So for this uh, 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 reason, we have created a layer group which can be created using this icon at the bottom. So when you create a layer group, you can put these two layers within this layer group. So now the advantage is now if I select this layer group and move, let's say I take the move tool, I select all the layers together with me. Are you following? I don't yes. have to work with individual layers. I can work with groups of layers. Now recall our first example where we had hello Bangalore text and behind the text, we had a rectangle blue box. Now the problem with that example was the blue box was independent of the text. Each one was moved independently. But if we had grouped those two into a layer group, we could have moved them together. So that is the usefulness of grouping layers together. Are you following? Yes. Yeah, so this is the example of so in this example, nothing new. The only uh, main thing we learned is how to create annotations, how to get arrow symbols into the system and how to group layers. So that is what was covered in this example. Probably the last example. After that, we can have questions. Last example is this one GraphQL. So this article is, uh, you know, a REST API to GraphQL migration. And we have an image here which has many parts A, B, C, D. And it is taken from a particular source uh, 2018. So if you go to the source, you will actually see these are all multiple images. So in the source, this is how they are presented the images. REST, React, REST, GraphQL, React. Then, uh, you know, GraphQL, React, REST, Apollo, and so on. So all are independent images. But when we write article on Devopedia, we can't upload so many images. And all are small images. So we want to consolidate or combine all this into a single image for this first question. So this is done simply uh, by importing all those images into GIMP. Uh, so. So let's say we uh, create a new image like this. Uh, it's come with this background, doesn't matter. I'm just showing you how to import something. So let's go back to our original source. Let's say this particular image. We will save it. 
actually there are many ways to do it i think because you can copy the image directly from your browser and paste it here right so notice what has been copied and uh, being pasted there is no actual background for this image so it looks like the image is a transparent background that is why you see the uh, background of red is preserved so now we don't want so uh, what we have done we simply copied it here copy image and we are pasting it here by doing control v now the image is not really pasted uh, in the sense that uh, there is some sort of selection and it is animated and if you look at layers what is happening in the uh, layers it says there is a background layer of uh, uh, red but the new one that we have pasted it is a floating selection so floating selection means it's not really a permanent layer so now there are two things that you can do the first thing that you can do is you can anchor the layer control h if you anchor the layer whatever you pasted becomes part of the uh, layer below it so in our case we started with the background layer of red and when we anchored it this became part of the background now this is not a good idea because now you can't move this you can't move this image it has become part of the pixels of the background layer so this is not what we want so let's do control z we get back our floating selection what we really want is move this to a new layer this is really what, what we want instead of anchoring the layer you say to new layer so whatever we pasted it is now part of the new layer what is the advantage now you can move this layer around right which was not possible in the anchoring situation now this uh, uh, whole image is not that great right there are many issues first of all our pasted layer is a different dimension from the image layer that is first thing we have to correct second is the background is also not right so let's correct that background first uh, we'll uh, make it a white background okay so we'll say our uh, background color let's select our background color make it white and then say uh, so select the background and fill with background color so now we are getting somewhere uh, now this layer here it is uh, bigger than the size of the image how do we correct for that very simple go to image fit canvas to layers so let's see what this does uh, so now we got somewhere closer to what we want so what has happened now the canvas size has expanded to fit the layer now we can go back to our layer and move the layer if we want okay now this also is not that great because what has happened to the background background only part of the ba background is white the rest of the background is transparent why has this happened because when we created the background layer it was of a smaller size and by doing this fit canvas to layers only the canvas uh, has changed so canvas is like the size of the image you can say but the size of this particular layer has uh, well the size of this layer has changed no doubt you can also see here scale layer uh, okay the size of the layer is still the same so what has happened canvas has changed how do we correct for that again very simple procedure go to layer layer to image size so what are we doing now we have selected the background which has a smaller size than the image and the canvas so go to that layer layer to image size so now you see we have corrected for that as well so this is uh, uh, something that we did similarly you copy the other images you can also do this copy and then paste same procedure paste it and then you move it to a new layer and then after doing that you can move it around so now you see it is not allowing us to move this is easily corrected by clicking on this move tool and clicking on the first box so this controls the move right so this is the way to move it and the rest of the stuff is very simple what is the final effect that we want we want to put these annotations a b c d and so forth we want to put this server side client side 
and then some uh, line just to make sure which is the server side and which is the client side. So all this can be easily done uh, with the basic tools. Arrow also, if you want, you can draw it yourself or you can import an arrow from the web. Okay. Another way to import is save this image. Let's say it is already saved on your file system. And you can come here, open as layers. OK, so I can come here. I have saved it somewhere. This one. Open. So when I do this, it comes, it is opened on a layer of its own. So that is what is given here. This is the layer which has been opened as a layer. And after bringing it in, you can move it around. So this is the way to play with the layers. So what did we cover in the final example? We looked at how to uh, copy and paste from an existing image, how to anchor the layer and how to move it to a new layer. We also saw if your uh, file is already saved in the file system, you can open it as a layer within the current image. So these are the main things I wanted to cover. Uh, any questions at this point? So we have like 10 minutes for Q&A. So you can ask anything, any doubts, uh, anything that you want to clarify. How do you select more than one layer? More than one layer. I don't think it is possible, but uh, typically that is where uh, the usefulness of uh, layer grouping comes. So you group these. So I have created a layer group. Now I move this to that group. Move it into that group. So typically this is the way to do it. You create a layer group like I showed you in the other example and then move the layers into that group. OK. Yeah. I'm not sure why it is not moving. So usually it is a straightforward thing. OK. Yeah, any other questions? So when you come across some uh, problems like this, you can always Google and find out the solution. So like here, I'm not able to move it into the group for some reason. So if you uh, Google it, you will find the solution for that. So if no questions, maybe I will show one final practical example, uh, which I always use. Uh, so I'll open uh, one particular image from Devopedia's. Uh, from be here. Uh, diagram. Version teaser, yeah. So we'll close this. So you see, whenever we make a release in Devopedia, we announce it on social media. And when we announce it on social media, typically we put an image, we put some text, and then we put our logo. So you can imagine how the layers will look like. Very simple. This is what the layers have. This is the layer. These are the layers we have. And uh, these, this is an old image. Yeah. This is what we have. This is what we have. Right. 
So this is the original image which was imported from the web. OK. But we wanted a lighter shade of the image. We didn't want exactly this kind of colors. So how is this? Uh, how was the image transformed to this lighter shade of blue? So the way to do it is we added a new layer here on top of this layer. And having added this layer, I can remove this. This layer is nothing but the gradient tool. Which we saw earlier, so the way to do this is select a foreground color. So for now our purpose, let's take uh, let's say a green color. As foreground and let the background color be maybe yellow. It's very weird color combination, but just to demonstrate the tool. And then we are going to drag it like this. Now this probably this is not the kind of gradient we want. So if that is not the case, you can double click on any of the tool. When you double click, you get the options. And then you can say exactly what type of uh, gradient you want. I want a linear gradient. OK, so then I say the same thing. So I got my linear gradient here. So that is done. Now I'll see how the image looks. So this is how you combine two layers and change the representation. So now our selection of colors is not that great, right? That is why you know the image has lost its value. But the original selection was pretty good. So this was the original image. We added a blue shading to it and we got this new image. OK, so so far so good. What about the text? Text is very simple. It's just another text layer. You can also enter new lines in the text layer. And this is what we got just released version 0.41. Then the logo. So logo is here right here. So uh, there is another logo which we are we don't care about. So let me show you how to get the logo in open as layers. Evopedia. So we have a folder here, probably logo. Version 2. And let's import the logo. So what kind of logo it will be? It will be a PNG, something like this. And uh, if you want the logo, there are many other uh, formats here. So logo with the trademark. So probably this is what we want. And we select specifically PNG. Notice how the logo is represented here. See, typically an image, it is uh, a rectangle. But because it's a PNG, some parts of the image are transparent. That is why when we import the logo, the background is still visible. Because you see these areas of the image, this is the whole image. But these areas are still visible because in this image that we have imported, the background is transparent. So that is why the iceberg on the, in the background is visible. So we have imported our logo, but of course it's too big. So let us scale the layer, scale the layer. Now, if I simply say 200 pixels, will it work? Yes, it works. Uh, because you see, when I change the width, the height also changes. Notice that when I change the width, height also changes. That is because we have enabled this uh, anchor icon, which says that these two are interlinked. So whenever this changes, this also should change, which is what we want in this particular case, because uh, otherwise the image will get distorted. See, see what happens if I don't enable this. If I scale this image, I disable this link and I simply say reduce the width to 200. Now you see my image is distorted because we have changed only the width without changing the height. So the way to avoid this pro problem is when you scale the uh, image or the layer, you always enable this uh, uh, linking. So then I can say 200. And uh, height automatically becomes 240. So it is scaled. Now it's uh, more closer to what we want. So I select the move icon and I move this to the corner. So this is exactly what we want in this particular case. Okay. The other way to scale is, of course, uh, you can also scale by percentage. So I'll go back to this scale. Instead of scaling by pixels, I say percentage. And I will have a rough idea. OK, it should be 20 percent. To scale it. OK, then I move it. So 
so you can scale by pixels or percentages or many other factors are out there okay what are the other layers this is the old layer yeah so that's it from my end uh, any questions so mainly this session was for devopedia authors uh, to help you edit uh, technical images and uh, when we look for uh, when we do reviews on our articles we look for clarity of the image the color combinations that you use the kind of the readability of the image so spelling errors basic problems with the image so we look for a number of these things and uh, it's possible that uh, images that you find on the web some of them have problems so like the image i showed you uh, in github github particular image we found uh, some errors in that image so you you can use gimp uh, to improve your image uh, before uploading it to devopedia any questions okay no questions thanks for being a patient audience i know it's been a long session uh, because gimp is a uh, quite a powerful tool lot of features are there and in this uh, session of 90 minutes we have somehow managed to cover a number of things i will summarize what are the things we covered we started by uh, control n that is creating a new file we looked at how to control the background color and the forward uh, foreground color we looked at uh, a selection of tools uh, rectangle tool elliptical tool which is also used for making circles we looked at the fuzzy select tool where we can select contiguous areas uh, using that tool and along with the fuzzy select tool we can also use control click which will help us to select multiple areas of the image and apply a single transformation to all of those images and apart from the fuzzy select we looked at the color picker where we you know like this is the color picker we looked at the color picker we also looked at a free select where we can uh, use free hand drawing to select a particular area we looked at rotating a particular uh, selection a particular layer we looked at how to zoom in zoom out we looked at the text tool how to add text to an image we looked at the gradient tool uh, so you can select uh, a particular part of the image and fill that particular part with the gradient of colors and that gradient is determined by a correct selection of foreground and background colors we didn't cover this tool which is a bucket fill tool but this is very much similar to what we saw here so you select a particular area of the image or layer and fill with foreground color background color or pattern so that is nothing more than the bucket uh, tool there are other bunch of tools which we did not cover but you can always uh, experiment with these things very easy to understand pencil paint brush eraser so many of these tools are coming from uh, like your old uh, software like paint we looked at layers we looked at how to group layers together how to move layers around and when there are layers you can also move layers up and down change the ordering of layers we looked at how to uh, selectively disable some of the layers we also looked at how to combine two layers so there are two types of controls available to you one is the opacity the other is a bunch of functions here normal is the default mode of combining layers but there are other modes like darken and uh, combine by color and so forth so with this introduction to gimp i think uh, we are ready to uh, start editing images for devopedia i hope uh, this session was useful to you